Well, I'm very grateful that I'm um, inside the car because it's been raining pretty heavily all night. I just hope that the um, stuff in the tent outside is safe and has managed to stay dry. But I'm glad that I wasn't out there. And I hope that the sail has done the uh, done its job as well in terms of holding it all together. But we'll, uh, we'll find out in a bit. Because I'll be getting up when it's uh, properly light. Well, it's a bit... Uh... A bit lighter now and the rain thankfully has stopped and the wind has died down a little bit so we're going to go and investigate the damage and um, sort of stuff out. It was actually in the middle of the night I didn't realize that the car alarm is sensor based in the front so I'd blocked this off with the curtain right um, but I'd sort of stuck my hand through to grab one of the leads that I'd forgotten that I needed to plug in and it set the whole car alarm off at about one o'clock in the morning so um, <laughs> I think I might have to find the sensor and cover it up, otherwise I'm uh, going to end up setting it off again every night, so. Oh, all fun experiences and working out exactly how to run the, run the, uh, the camp. But anyway, I'm going to get ready and, uh, head out in a bit. Doesn't look like it's held up too bad. I uh, had to just restake one or two things, which I'll go over and do again now. But that tent looks pretty dry to me, despite all the rain, so happy days. Alright folks, well good morning. Just uh, cooking off some sausages for breakfast. And I've got some bacon as well, I need to go. Just cooking up some food. Then we'll uh, be ready for some uh, Bible study and probably a live stream and then be ready to head on out. It's um, rained for most of the morning so far. Um, which means that I've been very grateful that I've been in the car and not in the little tent. Although the little tent looked like it's held up pretty nicely, so that's good. Um, I had to do some repairs to the uh, sail because part of that had collapsed. But overall, it's been a fairly successful night. So, get some grubbing me and then uh, do some study and head on down to the town. All right, folks, we are on our way. Wonderful. We're just heading out of the campsite now. Now, it's a little bit later than I had hoped. Um, I had hoped that it would be a little bit earlier, but everything was just so wet and horrible this morning, and it was so dark and just there. So by the time I'd motivated myself to get up and going, bear in mind that this is supposed to be a little bit of a break for me as well. Um, by the time I'd got myself going, it, you know, I thought I'd better get a proper breakfast. So we had some lovely. Uh, sausages and bacon and uh, then we did a little bible study i'll do a slightly more in-depth one a little later today and um, then there'd been partial tent collapses and the big awning outside had collapsed and so on and so forth so i had to sort all that out to make sure that was all good before we could go so uh, we got there in the end though and it's i think it should all be secure enough so we're now uh, just out of the village and heading over to Whitby, which is just a couple of miles down the road. Now, high tide, if you remember what I said yesterday, right? When it comes to Whitby, you go out at high tide. Why? Because a lot of your fossils are gonna be in the landslip and the cliff, so really, you access it as the tide goes out. You go out during high tide, as the tide is falling, once it hits low tide, you then start to head back on the low tide uh, after around an hour or so. So high tide is at two, p.m. today, uh, which is, it's now half past 11, so that's what, 12, 1, 2, 3 hours away or so, two and a half, three hours away. Um, that's when we'll want to head out, uh, and uh, low tide isn't until uh, a lot later this evening, so it'll give us plenty of time to actually uh, dig 
and explore this afternoon. So really I'm probably going to be out until dark because it's effectively set up in camp so we can do that. Uh, I'll probably be out until close, very close to dark anyway or really until I get to tired. So what we're going to do this morning, for the rest of this morning, uh, is we're going to go have a wander around Whitby. Whitby is a lovely village, it's a lovely place to go and uh, and see. There's some fabulous fossil shops uh, in Whitby, some of the best in the country, uh, so we'll have a little nose around in there as well. And um, also we'll uh, probably get some of these Whitby fish and chips, um, because they're pretty spectacular around here and uh, we might treat ourselves for lunch so that's a rough plan for today and uh, we'll be starting it in uh, six minutes because there's roadworks apparently but anyway Thanks. Well, here we are now um, at Whitby. We're out on the uh, on the prom, uh, which cuts the harbour in two. And uh, you can see there's the uh, Whitby cliffs behind me there. And you can see the abbey just on the top of the headland there. Um, so the uh, the abbey itself um, is is famous for St Hilda. And St Hilda has a connection actually to the fossils here, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. It's to do with those famous Ammonites. Um, but the uh, abbey itself up on the headland is, is a very impressive looking figurehead statement of this area. And the 199 steps that run down into the village of Whitby itself. Um, it's one of the uh, best examples of what is known as a Gothic abbey or a Gothic cathedral or Gothic building. Um, and originally it started off as a type of um, architecture uh, named after the Goths, which came from the continent, uh, the continental Europe. However, now Goth is associated with something a little bit different, um, something that is certainly seeped in witchcraft, paganism, um, a very sort of uh, dark uh, in terms of spirituality, uh, a very dark kind of um, philosophy. And um, Whitby here itself is sort of become the Gothic capital um, of, well, certainly the, the, the United Kingdom and uh, sometimes even in, in, in Europe it's still, uh, people will travel here. Not just for the abbey and the architecture around, but you can just kind of go into the town and have a look around and there's just pagan stuff everywhere. Um, whether it's, you know, vampire-themed hotels, because, of course, um, Dracula was, was, was written here. And so the, uh, the, the, the fictional story of, of Dracula was written here and based off some of the architecture and the stories that came out of here, mixed with the sort of Eastern European kind of uh, stories and, 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 and pagan um, understanding around things like vampires and the like. And... Um, he ended up actually um, writing that here. And so as you walk around, especially in October, there's this kind of stuff pretty much, uh, pretty much everywhere. It does make you wonder though, because, you know, Whitby in itself has got a very, very long uh, and strong Christian heritage, even uh, not just to the original um, abbey that was set up here, but also going further back than that uh, into the accounts and the stories of St Hilda and the, it, it's interesting that there's become almost in a sense plagiarised if you like um, hijacked in, in, in a sense but the geology here is certainly um, fascinating anyway the cliffs that you can see behind me are part of the Jurassic We'll be uh, heading down there in about sort of uh, half an hour or so after I've grabbed some lunch 
and seeing what we can find. There's all sorts of manner of uh, rather amazing and spectacular fossils to be found. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll carry on around here for a little bit, uh, taking in some of the sights, because it's a really good uh, place to get a good, a good view of the whole uh, area and all those cliffs. And then we'll go and get some fish and chips for lunch and uh, head out properly. What's also uh, fascinating as you sort of walk along here is that all the sort of um, the big pillars and the stones which are used to hold this pier together are actually from the local stone. You can see all manner of cross bedding inside them as well. So it's just, uh, it's just amazing. All right, so here we go. Fish, chips, mushy peas, and scraps. So let's go find somewhere that we can go and uh, enjoy them. All right, guys, well, here we go. Fish, chips, scraps, and uh, mushy peas. So we've got these are the scraps, right. Um, they're basically fried bits of... Uh, batter that floats to the top and you scrape them off. Amazing stuff. Mm. Just, just amazing. Crispy and all. And then we have underneath we've got the chips. So we've got our So we've got our fish on top and then our chips underneath. And they are amazing. And then these are mushy peas. They're basically a, uh, a, a dried pea um, that's then been wetened. And they're an old Celtic food. And yeah, I know what they look like, but I think they're amazing. So the tide is now on the turn, which is good, because it means it's time to get down to the beach. So we've come back to the car, um, which is just here, and we're going to uh, get ourselves, uh, let me stand this camera up, there we go. We get everything offloaded, reloaded, and, uh, and sorted out so that we can uh, get down to the beach and crack on with all of our brand new discoveries. I had a quick little look yesterday, as you know, and it's looking pretty uh, positive. So here's our trusty rucksack and the tools. So let's start gathering them together. Folks, this is it. We're on our way. You can probably see my attire has changed slightly. It's because just lugging the tools that I might need <laughs> down to the beach can uh, cause a bit of uh, exertion <clears throat> or requires a bit of exertion. Anyway, um, here we are, and you can see we are still a little bit early. The uh, tide is not quite far out enough for us to get to it easily but we could get over the top of those cliffs there a little bit which I might try and do so let's see if we start working our way over all right well while we are um, waiting uh, just a couple of minutes for the tide to go a little further because you can see it's still kind of uh, lapping at the bottom here and that's pretty deep there I have been caught out once before by um, 
wet bee because you can see that sort of point just over there. Um, you need to really be this side of that point before the tide catches you out and it did catch me and my brother out once and we ended up having to swim the last bit um, fully laden with fossils which really we should have just thrown our rucksack off and uh, left it at that but um, we did get quite wet and quite a scary trip back but never mind hey? <laughs> we did make it anyway and uh, I don't really want to be doing that again so I'm just going to give it a few more minutes for the tide just to get out a little bit but also just to let you can see where the water is kind of crashing up over the rocks I'll probably try and climb over some of those rocks to get to that first little cove um, just over the back there and um, that'll uh, be our first port of call to start finding stuff but I just want to let the rocks dry out a little bit first because they are notorious and stick when they dry so we'll just let them um, cool down a little bit. All right, let's talk geology then. Uh, what are these cliffs here? Well, these are all Jurassic. This is part of the Jurassic Strip that cuts up through the United Kingdom. Starts down, of course, in uh, Dorset. Uh, it's found um, all the way over in um, De uh, Devon, and, uh, and uh, sort of north of Dorset. It's found in the south part of um, Wales. It cuts all the way up through Oxfordshire and all the way up to Yorkshire and then carries actually on further north into Scotland. Um, so these are all of the uh, beautiful Jurassic cliffs and you can get all your regular suspects out of uh, these cliffs, everything from plants. Um, so what I'm particularly hoping to find are some of the um, cycads uh, or some of the ginkgos. You get some fabulous ginkgos. Both, of course, are living fossils. You get heaps of ammonites. You get heaps of um, bivalves and the seashells and all sorts of stuff. So we're certainly dealing with a flooded deposit um, for sure. But the cliffs here are quite unique because they, rather than in, you get like the Jurassic Lias, which is a layer of limestone, a layer of um, shale, you kind of get this here and you can kind of see some of that layering um, over on the cliff up there but what you also get here is quite a lot of sandstones and it's these kind of sandy limestones where you get a lot of the plant material out of and that's what makes it really quite unique this whole sort of Yorkshire coast so um, there's some really good chances of getting some good fossils here. You also get these kind of nodules out the cliff and you can kind of see them already and those are the nodules that can hold both uh, ammonites as well as ichthyosaurs so there should be a good opportunity for plenty of evidence evidence of flooding evidence of living fossils we'll just have to wait a few more minutes for the tide to get out before we head down there all right folks we've done actually pretty good already so we were just uh, heading out the tide is still pretty high um, we're just sort of making our way out over the rocks. But we found uh, a few little finds here just lying around already and one particularly nice find. So um, let's uh, get in and uh, have a little look. So you can see we've got our, our cliffs up here. Uh, we've got the grey stuff and we've got that sort of ready brown stuff. Well, the place where they come together you can often find things. So this grey stuff down here, this is where we found things like this. Um, this is the, uh, the, of course, the Bellum Knight, uh, the little squid-like creature picked fresh out of, the, uh, out of the rocks. And you've also got a couple of bivalves there as well. Now, what's interesting with these bivalves, there's a complete one. You can see, number one, that it's closed. Okay, so, um, well, really, number one, you know it's a bivalve because it looks like a bivalve. So it is a living fossil. Um, number two, it's closed. So this bivalve has been buried while it was alive. And in fact, all the bivalves and you walk along the cliffs, you see millions of the things just sticking out of the cliffs. Um, they've all been buried while they're alive. So we've definitely got evidence of rapid burial. And then we have some other bellum, uh, sorry, bracket, um, bivalves, these, these scallop shells, these uh, clam shells, which uh, actually uh, have been squashed. You can see how that one's actually been squashed so much it's turned into itself. Um, so not only quick burial, but also rapid burial and heavy burial. All this cliff face was buried down at the same time uh, and has produced 
this enormous deposit here. Now, if we come to this sort of ready sort of uh, orangey rock as well, that's where it sort of borders and joins the rocks down below. That's where you find a lot of plant stuff. Uh, and the Whitby plant bed, which is this kind of rock here, actually sits down underneath it. But look at what we've got here. It's an absolutely perfect segment of a horsetail rush. Um, a very, very large horsetail rush because, of course, even though these are living fossils, we still have these today. We call them uh, mare's tail or um, horsetail rush. Um, this uh, this horsetail rush fossil one is much, much bigger than it. So it has changed, but it hasn't evolved. It's gone downhill. It used to be bigger. Now it's much, much smaller. So we have an evidence piece from a living fossils and we have evidence of change that is not evolution. It's gone downhill. They used to be much bigger, this round segment. Uh, today they're spindly little rushes. We actually found some up on the cliff on the way down. So they're actually uh, still around today, but in a much, much smaller form. So that's a really, really nice find um, from this uh, plant bed here. And this is just up on the cliff in the rubble, just lying around. We haven't even got round to the really good patch yet, um, which we might need to wait until the tide just goes out a little bit further. It's going out pretty quickly now, but we've still got a little way off to go. So we keep digging, we keep seeing what we can find, and uh, who knows what else we'll uncover. All right, so we've come up to the cliff, and I just want to give you a little bit of a look as to just how many kind of fossils there are, even just a little section like this, just to give you a bit of an idea, right? All right, we've got one fossil here. You can see it just kind of peels out quite nicely. Little uh, clamshell there, so we've got clam, bellumnite just there, another clamshell, clamshell, bellumnite there, another clamshell, 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 clamshell up there, um, clamshell, I mean, we're going on and on and on, right? Another clamshell, clam, 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 it's just sort of collapsing as I'm pointing it out, clam there, clam there, clam there, clam, bellumnite, uh, bellumnite, uh, occasionally you also spot the odd, I mean, clam, 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 right? You occasionally you spot the odd uh, little bit of an ammonite kind of sticking out down below. But the, the point is, really, look at the immense amount of fossils in just a small little section of cliff here. We're not talking about a marine environment which is slowly having animals die and get buried and caught up and slowly build up over millions of years. We're talking an abundance of fossils in just one very small area. And this is just the surface. We can't really go into the cliff and dig in and see. And it, when you do, you find that it's just an enormous abundance of stuff there as well. And so the fossils go on and on and on. This is just an unbelievable volume of fossils in one particular area. Also, what's interesting is we're in the little sort of alcove here, which the sea has eaten away. But just look at what has caused it. Follow the seam, follow the crack. Can you see the crack running up? There it is there, look, all the way up. And you can see there's actually a fault line where the whole area has been shunted and it's actually created a weak spot which the sea has eaten down into. So we've also got evidence of tectonic shifting, large-scale earth shifting, after this has actually been laid down and buried. So we're talking immense amounts of pressure, immense amounts of movement as well, beyond anything that we see today, really. Um, so the evidence is starting to stack up, and it's fascinating getting in and actually digging out and seeing what these kind of fossils uh, show.